Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Information Reading Seminar where we are reading the paper Black Holes as Mirrors by Hayden and Preskill. Essentially the goal of this reading seminar has been to show you in more or less one-to-one -one real time how what's involved in reading a scientific paper in almost molecular detail where we try and recover and reconstruct the thoughts of the authors and the proofs, perhaps the missing proofs, and derivations and fill in all the gaps and details of a paper. That's the objective and I promised at the beginning of this series to only edit these videos very lightly to give you a sense of exactly what's involved in reading through a paper such as the one we've selected for this series. Now I've not quite broken my promise today but I certainly have done a little bit of homework in the meantime since the previous video just to make sure that I don't lead us down the garden path for the next couple of hours. So if you recall where we left off in the previous video, we were looking at the paper, we reached equation four, and equation four is a pretty seriously important equation for the consequences of this paper. I mean, uh, uh, the main physical content of the paper, uh, apart from some very fascinating buildup in terms of definitions of and assumptions about the dynamics of black holes. Essentially all the key physics of the paper, in my opinion, can be uh, traced to this paper, this equation here, equation four. And owing to the importance of this equation, it's very, uh, we, we, there's a certain amount of responsibility we have in trying to at least understand this equation, if not derive it outright ourselves. Now, the Full proof of this equation would take us a touch outside of the scope of these videos. However, I will give you access to a way to derive this equation using only elementary calculus and linear algebra and using material that you can already find online. In particular, this equation, I believe, unless I made a terrible mistake, can be derived using standard results about uh, integrals over the, uh, with respect to hard measure over the unitary group. And these identities, these unit integral identities that we will exploit to prove this formula will, uh, you, you, you will be able to derive them essentially using elementary calculus and linear algebra. So that's, that's the argument today. And I wanna make that at least plausible. And if not, in fact, get almost to the, to the full proof of this formula. I believe it's not going to be practical for us to prove this formula today, the one that's uh, advertised here. This is uh, the reason being that um, it's combinatorially intricate and the probability that I'll make a small error, as you'll see, will increase as we go through the terms and the, the integral, especially when I'm doing this in front of the camera. And instead I'll satisfy I'll be satisfied in these videos with arguing how you actually calculate all the terms that you need to calculate in order to get this bound uh, and leave, the, say, the final verification that I didn't drop factors of two and so on um, to, the, to you, um, although you'll be in possession of all the, the, the techniques that you need to do it. I estimate in reality, that we're, it's about an hour to a two hours work to actually prove this formula in real time, right down to the, the constants. Um, we are not gonna do that today. I'm not gonna take you through that process because I mean, as I said, I'm convinced I'll make too many errors that it, it will become uh, somewhat useless to, to watch me fumble and struggle through these, these details. Uh, best. This is the kind of calculation that's best done offline, but I will certainly take you through every single step that you need to do to reduce it down to linear algebra and calculus. Now, if you recall, I argued in, in the previous video, I had this guess, right, that, um, that, the, that the, the inequality comes from applying a, a simple matrix norm inequality uh, to, the, to the integrand and here was my conjecture that, that it was somehow of that form. Um, I believe that's the case. Uh, I've actually looked in the papers referred to here in, in Hayden and Preskill's paper here. So it says 
using standard estimates, right? 15 and 16, we find blah, 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 blah. I took a quick look at 15 and 16 just to, to check that um, what I thought they were doing was correct. Indeed, um, it, the approach that is employed in references 15 to 16, I would, I believe, is completely equivalent to what I'm going to show you today. Although what I'm going to show you today is perhaps slightly more generalizable and streamlined, depends on your point of view, I suppose, than what's presented in 15 and 16. And so I did a little bit of homework offline. I took a look at the papers 15 and 16. And uh, another thing I observed is that the proof of inequality four is pretty complicated. We're talking three or four pages of, um, of, of calculations, combinatorially uh, non-trivial calculations that the authors had to do in order to derive equation four. So equation four is not gonna come easy. We're gonna have to work for it. Um, but yeah, as I said, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to, to, to argue it using elementary methods. Okay, so here's the, 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 the guess from the previous video. The guess is that we're first gonna approximate the trace norm with the, the two norm or the Hilbert Schmidt or Frobenius norm. That's step one. And I believe that's absolutely what is in fact done in those references. And so now we can uh, move on to the actual calculation of the, the bound um, so how's it going to work? Well, we're going to take this integral here on the left-hand side and we're going to first approximate it by an integral of a two-norm quantity. So I'll just start by expressing the relevant objects that we need to do to carry out this integral here. So the first thing that we have here are these, these, these density operators, sigma nb prime and sigma n. So let's just recall the definitions of sigma nb prime. Sigma nb prime is the trace out of R, the radiation of the following density operator. You do nothing on n, and then you have the black hole dynamics vb, and then you have the initial state, and then, well, we're just doing this in the Schrodinger picture, but in the density operator formalism. And so sigma nb prime is this operator here. Uh, sigma n is also something that appears in the derivations. What's that? Well, that's what you get when you trace out of b prime of sigma n b prime. Let's actually do this calculation. We'll see if we get a really nice answer. So it's worth going through to the end. So if you take trace out b prime uh, of sigma n b prime, well, let's substitute in sigma n b prime. Well, that's good. We get another trace and then all that stuff goes in there. But now we've got a trace of a B prime and R, so that's just the same as trace of a B prime R of that stuff before. And now the interesting thing will happen. Rho N B is the initial state of black hole and Charlie. Now note that B prime R is what B dissolves into B prime the stuff left in the black hole in R. So tracing of a B prime in R is the same as tracing of a B. But if we're tracing of a B, then we can use the cyclic rule of trace. Oops, there's got to be a dagger in there. The cyclic rule of trace to bring VB, this unitary that acts on the black hole internal degrees of freedom around and it cancels with the VB prime there. So what we're left with is this. I'll just write it out in its pedantically with identity operators here. So we end up with this, but this is nothing, this term here is nothing other than rho in B. And then we're tracing out B prime and R of rho in B. And uh, what we're left with is rho in, right? But rho n, that's Charlie's half. That's the completely mixed state, right? The identity operator on Charlie's bit divided by the dimension of Charlie's space. So sigma n is really the same as rho n, which is really just the completely mixed state on Charlie's uh, qubits. Okay, so there's a little simplification that happens there. 
Uh, and the next thing we need to do to derive the bound in the paper is we need to talk about sigma b prime max. Well, the authors tell us that sigma b prime max is also a maximally mixed state. So it's just a gain, the completely mixed state on the black hole internal degrees of freedom that are left over after the radiation has been emitted. And so then if we look at the left-hand side of the bound that we're meant to be working with here, we see that it's really of the form of the integral of sigma n b prime. So here's bound it's the integral of dvb of the norm of sigma n b prime minus sigma n tends to sigma b prime max, but they're both maximally entangled, maximally mixed states. You know, just substituting in what we've already observed. So this is actually what happens when we substitute in all the information that we have to hand. And uh, we want to bound this integral. And I'm, as I said, I'm pretty convinced that, that we're going to be using the following bound. Um, namely, the, the bound that relates the two norm and the... the Frobenius norm and the trace norm. And uh, let's write that all in. Just gonna change the notation slightly here. And remember there's a factor, right? We have to input this four, the, this uh, overall scalar factor, which is equal to the dimension of the whole thing. Um, n, but n, little n in this context here is the dimension of the full system, which is n b prime. So we, the, 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 the factor we need here is n, the dimension of n and b prime. So that's sort of like step one. Uh, and you can sort of see that maybe we're not totally off track here because there's an n b up there. So this b prime is, you know, some radiation factor or something like that. Good, then we're going to focus then on this integral here. This is our goal for today. And you'll see why I've changed the background eventually today to this blue square grid background. So this is our goal. We want to understand this quantity here. So the next step is to actually just evaluate that. Um, so we're going to call this, I don't know, let's call this star. Star is our goal today. We're going to evaluate star. We're not going to approximate it. We're literally going to evaluate it. We're going to find out the, the, the number that star is equal to. And uh, to do that, we first have to use the definition of the Fabrinius or the trace norm, or the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. And that is really put in the argument and square it. Everything's omission here. So that should work all right. I'll write out the square in full. And you'll see why eventually that would be a good thing to do. Okay, there we go, that's the Frobenius norm in details. And you can see we've got four terms we're gonna to have to deal with when we expand out these brackets, four terms. And we'll have to evaluate each of these four terms. Three of them will turn out to be pretty easy indeed. So it's only the fourth one that will cause us some pain and indeed it will cause us quite a lot of pain. Um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay, step, let's expand out the this brackets. So we've got four terms. So term one, and the one that is the most horrible is sigma nb prime squared. Then we've got the identity operator times by sigma nb prime. What do you get when you do that? Well, you just get sigma nb prime divided by the dimension of, sig of nb prime. We get another term like that. So we just get two of those. And then we finally get an identity term and then this nb prime appears with a square down there. And now you can see that three of these terms turn, uh, pretty much straight away become pretty easy to deal with. So if you take the trace of the second term, then we've got a factor here, two over n, the dimension of nb prime, and a density operator, and the trace of a density operator is always one. So that term will evaluate to, in yellow will evaluate to one, the term here, the third term on the right, evaluates to the dimension of nb prime, right? Because the identity operator, you have to, the trace of the identity operator is the dimension of the space it acts on. And we're left with the following uh, 
result. So we've got minus two over n b prime minus n b prime over n b prime squared. That cancels out and we're left with, oops, there should be a plus sign here. I've already made a mistake, oops. So there's a plus sign here. So I'll we'll put some squiggle brackets around all of this. And then the next line here gives us the more or less, well, it gets rid of all the trivial stuff and leaves us just with the, the horribly non-trivial stuff for this calculation. So we just get a minus one over n b prime. Okay, that's star, right? Star is now reduced to, oh yeah, we can do, and then the, the hard measure is normalized to one. So this, this final term here, this constant term, we can do that integral super easy. And, and what we're left with is this, right? Uh, plus integral dv b trace of sigma n b prime squared. All right. So the first term, easy peasy, it's just a number, it's a super tiny number, right? N and B prime, the number of degrees of freedom, is, you know, some number of qubits. Uh, the black hole's got many qubits, so this is an exponentially tiny number, this, the first term here, this constant term. It's really the second term that's gonna carry the, um, the non-trivial stuff. And uh, that's what we're gonna focus on now. We're gonna try and evaluate the second integral here. Now, this is, not a trivial integral to do, uh, and I will try and explain this integral um, in a simpler way as possible, um, and you'll see that it's unfortunately combinatorially intricate. So we're gonna focus on this thing here that's called this star star now. So all the non-trivial stuff in this bound is stuck in star star, Let's work out star star. What does it look like? Well, we're gonna to have to start substituting back stuff in in order to understand this thing. And the first thing you gonna do is you gotta substitute in the definition of sigma nb prime, and that is the trace over r of uh, the identity on n tensor v b rho n b, the identity on n tensor v b to dagger, and we're gonna do it all again, right? Because it's squared. And this is why this thing is a real pain to calculate. That's star star, right? Star star is this thing. Now, yeah, you might hope, right? That, you know, we've got a lot, a lot of traces going on here. Maybe we can do some cyclic rule of trace. No such luck, I'm afraid. Every one of these four V unitary operators will play a role. None of them cancel. There's no psychic rules you, of trace that you can use to cancel any of these. Uh, you should not even attempt to use some norm bounds that you, you might know. There's no avoiding it. We're gonna have to evaluate this somewhat complicated integral. And this integral is over the Haar measure. Uh, so it's like we're integrating a quartic function of the of the integration variable over the compact unitary group of matrices. Now, remarkably, uh, you can do this, and not only can you do this, you can do this analytically. And there's a, uh, a variety of ways that have been developed to calculate such things. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to manipulate this expression into a form where you can uh, look up the result from uh, the appendix of a paper we recently wrote um, or you can look it up in another reference. I mean, certainly we claim no uh, priority on, on this, this, this result that I'm gonna to explain today, but it is kind of, um, I would argue, pretty elementary way to calculate uh, these Haar measure integrals. So if you're interested in calculating Haar measure integrals and you don't want to remember much beyond some basic linear algebra and calculus, uh, I have a method for you. So when we were working recently on this paper called No Free Lunch or Quantum Machine Learning, it became necessary to do some somewhat complicated integrals over the Haar measure. And one of the problems with doing integrals over the Haar measure is it's a right pain to remember factors and dimensions and normalizations and tensor factors and uh, orders and 
if you look up, if you Google like the the, the formulae that you need, uh, the formulae for hard measure integrals, everyone uses a slightly different notation, and it's easy to, to mess mess up factors of dimension and so on. So uh, it was. I found it personally helpful to just read, find a very elementary way to re-derive how to do hard measure integrals, measures uh, integrals over the unitary group. And uh, I've summarized this, we summarized this in the appendix to this paper, which you can download. Uh, but I also made a video uh, explaining this method as well, which I will link in, in the description of this video today. You can go, go ahead, go watch that video. You can understand, I think, pretty much everything you need to know about the hard measure for the unitary group and how to calculate the integrals over the hard measure using really just linear algebra and a bit of calculus. It's pretty cool. And today, the formula that we're going to use from that paper, uh, and I'll show you how we can manipulate the, the star star into the form where we can apply this formula, appears on page eight of this appendix. Now, don't worry, it's, it's uh, in, in the video I've linked in the description, uh, you will learn how to calculate this, this formula here in red. Um, our goal today is not to calculate this formula. We're going to use it. Uh, and as I said, I'll hereby uh, outsource this part of the explanation of the bound to another video. It's not too bad. It's only about an hour of extra work. And so we're just going to apply this formula um, directly to proving star star. But to, before we do that, we sort of have to manipulate star star a bit. Star star is not quite in the ideal form for applying that uh, result. And in particular, we're gonna have to move things around using uh, tensor network tricks. So the, the objective now is to express the integrand here in such a way that we can apply this formula from this appendix. And to do that, I'm gonna introduce or exploit some tensor network notation. So there's now, by now, enough videos on the internet and talks that you should be able to pick up tensor network notation just by Googling around. And But even if you don't wanna look at them, I, I'd hope very quickly you'll pick up how tensor network notation works in this context here. So if you have a matrix, M, we're gonna represent a matrix as a blob with two legs. This is the input leg, this is the output leg. Um, and these, in, uh, these letters here indicate the indices. So uh, the matrix element of the matrix M, J, K is represented by this picture here. If you have a vector, a vector is nothing other than a blob with one leg. If you have a matrix times by a vector, then you can draw that as an M and a V. Now here comes the magic of tensor networks. Whenever you join these legs, these open legs together, you're meant to sum over the common index. So there's always an index associated with the leg of a tensor. And when you have two common legs joined together in such a fashion here, you're meant to sum over the index that's, you're meant to set the indices. So you've got somehow J prime for the matrix M, which is the, uh, a blob with two legs. You've got the index J for the vector V. You're meant to set these indices equal and then sum. And so that's what joined legs means. Con the joined legs are called contractions. And when you see them, you sum over the common Uh, the common uh, index. And I see now that I've just slightly messed up the notation. Um, I apologize. It should have been the other way around. Now it should work. Okay, so this is a graphical notation for representing common operations in linear algebra, namely contractions, tensor contractions. And we will exploit that to represent some of these operations that we're doing here in this integral star star. Integral star star involves doing some partial traces 
and some matrix multiplications. You see, there's nothing more complicated in here than traces, partial traces and matrix multiplications. And to just visualize this object and to make our lives a little bit easier, we're gonna um, exploit this tensor network notation in the following way. So firstly, the, 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 we have to cope with representing the various things in here. So the first object that, that really appears in here is rho nb. Rho nb appears inside the integral star star. What is rho nb? Rho nb is a matrix, right? Uh, it's got, but it's a rho, it's a matrix acting on a tensor product vector space. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually draw two legs. You know, one leg is representing the tensor subsystem N, the other leg is representing the tensor subsystem B. So rho and B is represented now as this blob and uh, is really a matrix on a joint acting on a tensor product system NB. We have another operation here, a mat uh, another matrix, a unitary matrix V. The unitary matrix V uh, is a matrix in an axon, a subsystem B. Um, and uh, as such, it's a matrix, so it has one leg. Now, of course, uh, later on, rho, the subsystem B gets redefined or gets pulled apart into two pieces, right? There's, there's uh, the radiation, the outgoing radiation, and the stuff that's left over in the black hole. So So it becomes convenient to take this leg here representing the internal degrees of the black hole and to think of it as just two legs acting on these two tensor product subsystems. And then V similarly becomes a two leg, a, a, a tensor with two legs in and two legs out just representing B prime and R. Okay, actually I think I should put the indices the other way around. Uh, to, to match the paper. Let's just take a look. In the original paper, it's R B prime N. But then they swap around to N B. N B prime R. Yeah, I think it's N B prime R. N B prime R. So this is something that you might notice when reading through the black holes paper. The tensor product, the order of tensor products for subfactors gets sort of changed around. This makes no difference. I mean, if you, you label the tensor product factors N, B, R prime and so on, uh, whether you label them going N, B or B, N, it doesn't make a difference as long as you keep the same labeling all the way through the, your calculations. All right. So the, here we, we have two matrices, rho and B. We have V, B, and we represent them as the following blobs. Now we have another operation, right? Trace. So trace of a matrix M is represented in the following way. You take the matrix as a tensor network, which is a blob with two legs, and a trace is just joining the bottom leg to the top leg. I mean, you want to contract over the index K and you do so, remember what contraction means, it means joining, it means setting the indices equal and summing, and uh, in tensor network like notation, that means just joining the common legs. Let's do that. Well, here's the answer. That's what the trace is per definition, and then we have a tensor network blob picture representing exactly that linear algebra expression. So now, to, do, to deal with star star, we're gonna draw some pictures representing these linear algebra operations. Now you don't have to do any of this. You may not like tensor network diagrams at all. You can just leave things fully explicit, indices and all. Uh, and uh, there's, you, there's no um, necessity to draw these pictures. I find them uh, personally extremely very helpful um, when doing these kind of lengthy linear algebra computations. So uh, if you, however, if you don't find them helpful, just don't just replace every picture back by the, the matrix element definitions and you'll get the same answers. So let's, uh, let, let's get to it, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate this trace of, trace of, oh, I won't write it out again. So we got essentially 
two matrices, let's just call it big X, right? We've got this matrix big X twice, big X is, well, why call it big X when actually we have already given it a name and the name it is sigma NB prime. So what I wanna do is the first step here is to write out sigma NB prime uh, in terms of tensor network diagrams, just so we can do the linear algebra, I would argue slightly easier. So what is rho NB, a uh, sigma NB prime? Well, that's the trace out of R of a, a product of three matrices. Now, rho NB is a matrix, VB is a matrix, the identity matrix is a matrix. Oh, the nice thing about tensor network notation is that tensor products are so easy. So in tensor network notation, so if you've got X tensor Y, then the picture that you associate with that is just juxtaposition. Just take the two diagrams, stick them together. Too easy. Um, and another one that's really not super nice is that the identity matrix itself is just a straight line. You can prove that, it's not so, not, not so complicated. So now, with these little observations in hand, we can come up with a nice tensor network picture for sigma NB prime. Sigma NB prime is a, a matrix that acts on two subsystems, N and B prime. And how do you calculate it? Well, you'll do a trace of some matrices, uh, and here it is, so rho N, We've got row N, B, but remember B is B prime R. And then we act with a V dagger on the top and a V on the bottom. Oops, sorry. And we've got to take a trace over this R degree of freedom. Now in my notes, I have the V dagger down here. It won't actually make a difference. So this is uh, the tensor network picture for what sigma in B prime is. It's a, it's a product of three matrices, V, B dagger, tensor the identity, Rho N B prime R and V B tensor the identity and a trace. So a trace, remember, just means connecting common legs, and we're tracing just over the R subsystem. So that's why we got that loop there. So now we got a nice little tensor network picture for sigma N B prime. And what we need to do to to do our calculation today is not get a tensor network diagram for sigma N B prime, but we need a tensor network diagram for sigma N B prime squared. And the beautiful thing about uh, tensor network diagrams is you can do that by, by simply stacking and joining. So I'll just do it all again. And now that's the, the first sigma NB prime, but we've got to multiply these two things. So we need another one down here. And this is what happens when you try and join these guys. There's the second NB, sigma NB prime. And there it is. We've got our first tensor network representation for the integrand of that uh, star star integral. And it ain't pretty, right? So there's uh, loops and all kinds of things stuck together. This will turn out to be the the main complication in evaluating this integral, the fact that we're sort of taking partial traces of objects that involve unitaries and various tensor subsystems. And so that's the integrand, right? The integrand of star star equals this, this thing. And our goal is to evaluate this tensor network here. Uh, but not quite, right? Because we haven't taken the trace of this is, so the integrand is equal to the trace of this expression here. And we can do the trace, remember, by, by joining the tops and the bottoms 
of the legs representing the, the, the matrix elements. And so that's what the integrand looks like. The integrand looks like this tensor network here. And so our goal is to evaluate literally this tensor network integrated over the whole unitary group. And the thing that's going to trip, you know, the, the, the thing that really complicates this evaluation is the fact that the matrix V appears four times in, in this expression, sort of buried in various ways in there. And uh, meaning that we're evaluating a quartic expression of the argument over the entire uh, compact unitary group. Uh, but don't worry, we can do this. And uh, um, that's where we will now exploit a neat formula from uh, the theory of harm measure integrals and the one that I advertised coming from the paper. We're not quite at the stage where I think it's we can apply the formula. Um, no, I guess we'll apply the formula to this picture. So to summarize, We've now got, we've now processed our integral into a, a, an object that we can evaluate. So I claim. And uh, the object we need to do is we need to calculate the following integral here. So. And I'm going to put here as the integrand, I'm going to write down that expression here that we've, we've built. And I'll be a bit slow about it this time. Try and draw this picture nicely because I'm going to use it, I'm going to cut and paste this picture actually quite a few times when we try and evaluate this integral. As you'll see. So I'm going to just take this. Remember, rho has three legs that emerge from it. Well, I can. And then we're taking this trace. So up here, I had the, the, the first leg, the one representing the n subsystem. I had the trace going around to the right. Well, it's exactly the same as if you take the trace going around the left. Uh, and then we have this leg coming through like this, if you look up here. And then these two legs come out, and then these come back in here, they're joined up. And then if you look in the middle, this leg here is joined up so, but then we've got these partial trace loops coming around here like so. And we've got another trace that comes around all the way around. So that's the, the integral we have to evaluate. I'll just draw this picture a bit symmetric, more symmetrically. So I've dropped the B on V on the integral over the compact unitary group. So we just drop the B, we know the B is there. So that's the thing we've got to calculate. How are we going to do it? Well, to, do, to, to calculate this, We're going to use a formula for an object that we called S4 in the this no free lunch paper that I quoted at the beginning of this video. And what is S4? So if U is a unitary matrix. And you have to take the integral of the following expression over the unitary group. And this is where things get uh, unfortunately combinatorially intricate. Then you have a thing called S4. So uh, S4, well, I should call this S4 twiddle because as you'll see it differs ever so slightly from the version in the paper, but I'll quote to you the correct answer. So S4 is defined to be this, this integral here. Now, um, 
I've rotated these diagrams a bit. Um, that's in order to uh, make them compatible with the, the no free lunch paper. So I just want to make it clear, you know, uh, what, what does this mean? Firstly, mathematically, this, this tensor network picture here means the integral of u tensor u dagger tensor u tensor u dagger. So S4 twiddle is this is this integral here over the unitary group. So we, in, we take u, u is a unitary matrix. We take it uniformly at random from the unitary group. We take the average and the integrand is a gigantic tensor product of u four times and u, u and u dagger. And uh, what I've drawn here on the left is the tensor network diagram representation of exactly that thing there. And I've drawn it sideways. So this is a bit different from the way I did it before. Um, but here's the, you know, there's no re there's no requirement in tensor network notation that the legs always go from bottom to top. You know, here, previously, we've been sort of thinking about um, time, time, if you like, in, in all of these computations is going from from bottom to top, but there's no, you know, so the K index is like the input and the J index here for the matrix M is the output. However, you could easily just have had um, those legs coming from the sides. And so you can think of the legs as coming from the left to the right, if you like. So as long as you keep track of what's input and what's output, then everything will be fine. So you have this S twiddle. S twiddle is a gigantic integral of the unitary group. And uh, it turns out you can evaluate this, this integral exactly. There is an exact formula for this thing. And uh, I'll write out the answer. You can find this result in the, the paper I quoted. And then you'll see why I chose grid paper for today. So the, the answer is given by this tensor network diagram here. So that's sort of the input for the for unitary one. This is the output for unitary one. This is the input for unitary two. This is the output for unitary two. This is the input for unitary three. So input one, input two, input three, input four goes to one, four, prime, two prime, three prime, four prime. You'll see why I'm dwelling on this in a second. And these lines mean uh, that tensor network leg is joined to the other one, or there's a chronic delta if you like. So this integral is equal to that, exp that object there, minus one over d, d squared minus one. Uh, and then we're gonna do the whole, whole business again. In fact, there's four terms. Four whole terms here that we have to worry about. And here's the next one. And then comes a one over d squared minus one. And the fourth term as this tensor network representation here. So there you go, S4 twiddle. This f funny quartic object has the following uh, representation. That's a, a total, it's completely analytic. There's no approximations involved here. And that's how you evaluate S4 twiddle. Now, S4 twiddle, however, is not quite what we have in the integrand for star star, if you look at it, right? Sort of looks a bit different. But what we're gonna do is uh, really look at the picture for star star, for the integrand of star star, and just see uh, S4 living inside it. So I'm gonna highlight now uh, for, you know, firstly, the first thing to note is that what we call U Oh yeah, I didn't explain this fact. There's a factor D appearing here. Uh, 
So D, D here is the dimension of the unitary matrix U. Now in, in star star, we're having to do an integral over the unitary matrices, but the matrix V acts on the tensor product space uh, B prime R. Yeah, so V acts on, and so D is the dimension of B prime and R. V is a unitary matrix, it acts on a joint subsystem B prime R. And therefore D, the D, the dimension of the unitary matrix involved in this 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 integrand, this integral here of the Haar measure is in fact the dimension of B prime R, which is written in the black hole's paper with this absolute value type sign. So now our goal is is somehow to see this formula in this formula here and you can do it you know uh, with a little bit of manipulation so i'm going to try and do this with a bit of sort of cut and pasting and hopefully uh, you, you'll you'll see the same formula as well so what we'll do is we'll uh, maybe i'll copy this stuff here and then paste it down here. Okay, that actually worked. Usually copy and paste is a bit flaky on OneNote, but here today it worked. Okay, what we want to do is we want to just, we're going to sort of massage the legs in this, this expression here, just to, 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 so we can see this formula V uh, S4 twiddle sort of hidden, buried inside this expression. So I'm going to do, I'm just going to pull legs around. So you can, I hope you, you, know, you with a bit of practice, you, you should be able to um, convince yourself that uh, moving legs around doesn't change the, the, the number that this network evaluates to. So there's, I've just sort of drew, pulled out this, this V here. And I'm going to pull out the V prime as well. Uh, the V dagger as well. So the inputs of V dagger, well, now, now it gets a little bit awkward. So the V dagger, the outputs of V dagger go in like so. And we got to join up, oops. The output of V dagger goes in like so. And there's a dagger missing down here. So I've just sort of stretched and pulled the legs around, massaged them around. And then the left output of V goes into the left input of V dagger. And the left input, but uh, the right input of V dagger goes all the way around to the right output of V. Okay, so I hope you uh, agree with me that that these two diagrams are the same. So I've written the word in here and out here, right? So we got four operators. There's the inputs, there's the outputs. And I hope I've got that correct. I think so. 
And all I've done is sort of with an ice isotopy is moved some V's around and massaged the, the, the legs around so that we've got something that looks a bit more like S4, S4 twiddle. And I'll color it in. So look, this thing that I'm coloring in in blue is exactly S4 twiddle. And what we're gonna do is apply the formula we have for S4 twiddle and stick it in place of the blue stuff and leave those legs there and then contract the legs. That's the, the whole strategy now for the rest of this proof. And this is where things will get obscenely intricate. So what I'm gonna do is take this, uh, this, this, this diagrammatic representation and substitute in place of blue the formula we have for S4 twiddle. So we're gonna get four terms. four terms. And I'm certainly not today going to evaluate all four, term, four terms. That's, that's the bit where I will uh, outsource this, this calculation to you as the viewer. Um, and instead, I'll just, we'll just deal with the first one. And then once you've seen how to calculate the first term, then you should, I hope, see that the remaining three terms follow exactly the same uh, structure or have the same way of, of, of way of method of evaluation. Now we can't quite directly apply S4 twiddle uh, to the blue thing because each of our unitaries has two input legs and two output legs. So what we have to do is we have to double the legs. Um, so to apply the S4 formula, we have to note that V that we sort of have to, uh, to, to double the legs because you, the, the U involved in, in the, the answer for the evaluation for S4 twiddle is you're thinking of that as acting on two subsystems, namely N and, uh, and namely B and R prime. And so we're gonna have to double everything in there. So that the formula for S4 that we're gonna use, S4 twiddle is gonna be exactly this, but we're gonna double every leg. So I'm gonna copy this formula here. Paste it down here. And so the actual formula that we need to use will be found as follows. So every time we have a leg in here, uh, remember our unitaries are acting in, on two subsystems in parallel, B and R prime. So we have to double the legs. So it gets this is the fourth input for B and R prime. And then I have to double every, every one of these legs here. And it gets right really pretty tedious pretty quickly to draw these diagrams. But that's how you evaluate S4 twiddle. And then I'll do the same here. This one's a little bit easier to draw. This one's also correspondingly not so difficult. I'm actually gonna do the most difficult term, I think, today and the other Three terms will be a piece of cake once you can do this. It doesn't matter if you have over or under crossings, I'm just drawing them with arbitrary over and under crossings just to make sure you don't think that these lines are joined together. So this is what we really need to do. We really need to substitute this picture here in place of the blue stuff up here. So let's get started. There's no substitute. We now know we're doing some real science. You know you're doing science when you're having to do hard combinatorics. So we're doing some proper hardcore science now. We're gonna take this first term here and substitute this first term here 
and substitute it in place of the blue highlighted stuff there. So I'm gonna try and draw this picture as disciplined as I can. Uh, I'll draw the boxes for the V's in a different color. Be green. So this is the first V. Actually, I'll use three gap, put gaps of three between these things. And then we have, and I'll zoom out, just to get an overview of what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to use this expression we have for S4, twiddle, to replace this expression with the four Vs and V daggers. And I've got to put a row in there in between these Vs and V daggers. So let's put row in black. Row is just a constant as far as this calculation is concerned. And remember, these Vs have inputs and outputs, and these inputs and outputs are gonna be wired together using these wirings here that come from the formula for S4 twiddle. And so the next part, when we transcribe this diagram here, is we've gotta stick the inputs and the outputs in the right place. Um, I'll start doing that now. So here comes, this leg comes down like that for row, it goes up like that. Then we have the two Outputs of row going into the inputs of the V. There they go. And then remember we have the outputs of row coming into the V down here. And then we have this funny thing where the outputs of the V dagger come around like so. And same down here with the other V dagger. And then we have this thing where the output of the V comes into the input of the V dagger. but the other one comes around, rolls around. This is super tedious, but the, I don't see any shortcut available here. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so there, what I've done is I've just rewritten, oops, I've rewritten the integrand here with the Vs left as these green boxes with the inputs and the outputs indicated. And what we're gonna do is substitute in place of these Vs, we're gonna apply formula S4, twi for S4 twiddle, we're gonna substitute in these wirings here that are indicated. So we're gonna join up the appropriate inputs and outputs. And I'm gonna do that in blue. So the first thing to note is that the two inputs for unit, the, the first tensor factor are joined to the, the outputs of the fourth tensor factor. So, you know, we have this firstly, this constant factor at the front, one over d squared minus one. And remember, we've got to focus now on this, right? This is the, to, to do these calculations to be very, slow and discipline. We're gonna try and draw these, these tensor, uh, these, these contractions in here. So the inputs of the first unitary here are joined to the outputs of this one down here. So how do we do that? Inputs go to outputs, right? Um, and it's gonna get really super messy. So am I gonna do this clever? I don't really see a clever way to do this, but maybe I do. So this input here, 
has got to join up to the output down here. And this input here has got to join to the output down here. Okay, that's our first part of that diagram. Now let's do the next part. You know, we're one quarter of the way through just this diagram. So the inputs of the second unitary factor are joined to the outputs of the third. Inputs of the second joined to the outputs of the third. Uh, yeah. Inputs have got to be joined to the outputs of this one. Now, let's do the next one. Oopsies. The inputs of the third go to the outputs of the second. And that's going to happen sort of over here. Okay. I didn't leave myself super lots of space here. I'm sort of struggling to see how to get this through. There, those ones are joined up there. It's a bit awkward, um, but that's how it is. And then the final one is that the inputs of the fourth factor go to the outputs of the first. Oops. Inputs of the fourth go to the outputs of the first. And there again, we haven't left ourselves super lots of room, but everything up I think it goes like this so now we've we're done with the first term effectively we haven't quite done we have to start following all these lines around and simplify this diagram a bit and so we'll, you know plus dot 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 three more terms and those three more terms are definitely homework for you to do We'll go through this first term here and see what comes out. And to work that out, we're going to just follow these lines around and see where they take us. Hopefully, they take us on a little journey that will lead to a simple term. And we're going to start with our two rows. And let's follow these lines around. So some of them we already have already. Those lines, are, I'm just copying this black loop here. And let's start following some of these lines around, see where they take us. I think an interesting one to follow are these. These look like they'll go somewhere pretty good. These two lines, so the inputs to this row come around to the outputs of that row there. Well, that was convenient. That simplified really nicely. Now let's follow, oops. I'll do that again. Now we're gonna follow the outputs of this row up here. Where do they go? Down here, around here. Oh, they go to the inputs of that row there. And so that, that diagram has dramatically simplified. Actually, something else has happened. Namely, we've got some loops that have appeared. So here, if we follow these blue legs around here, they come around here, they go around here, they come around here. And we get this long loop appearing. In fact, I believe that we get two additional loops like that. 
one for n and one for b prime. Sorry, one for b prime, one for r. And so that first diagram simplified all the way down to this thing here. Now when you have a loop, a loop is just the trace of the identity matrix. It just reports the dimension of the space it acts on. So plus three more terms. So what we end up with is the following thing here, d squared minus one times the dimension of b prime times the dimension of r, which is otherwise known as b prime r. And then what's this diagram here? Well, we've got the output of rho going into the input of rho, and then we're taking the trace. So this is just otherwise known as the trace of rho squared. And when you substitute in what is d, remember d is itself b prime r squared minus one b prime r times trace of rho n b squared. So the first term plus three more terms. The first term has a very important structure and this, this is the thing I want to highlight. We get trace of rho n b squared and we get some factor at the front. So now if we backtrack all the way back to our original formula star star, in fact, our original bound, let's see if we can sort of anticipate the structure of the bound that they receive, that they obtain in the black holes as mirrors paper. So here's the bound we need to evaluate. Call it star, right? We've got a factor of nb prime times by this integral here. This simplifies a bit, blah, 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 to this integral here. And then we've got this trace of sigma nb prime squared and some constant factor. And then star star is the thing we've been working on the whole time. And as you substitute in the various terms, you end up with at the bottom of all of this, something of the form trace of rho and b squared times by a factor. And I claim the other three terms will, will give you things that have the same form, trace of rho and b squared times by some factor. And then if we look back at the original paper, we see, look at that, right? Trace of rho n b squared times by some factor. Now, I admit I haven't checked that the other three terms add up to give you exactly that factor there, but I'm willing to bet you that they do. Uh, and that's something that is a very good homework for you to do. So it would take me to do the other three terms, probably another 20, 30 minutes, I suppose. I'm not 100% convinced I'd make no errors. So I think I'm going to leave that to you. And so these videos won't give you quite the most realistic one-to-one -one experience of reading through this paper, but it's pretty close. And so that's it for today. I've shown you how to derive the most important inequality in the paper, in my opinion, um, using effectively linear algebra and calculus. And I've also you know, introduced you to a general method for evaluating integrals over the half measure of the unitary group. And in the next video, we're going to investigate the, conse uh, the consequences of this bound and take a look at the actual uh, physical content of this uh, result. Okay, but that's it for today. Thank you very much and goodbye.